Christ has died, but the story did not end on Friday. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The Lord be with you. Let's join in prayer this morning. Lord, how wonderful. Beyond any of our understanding is your mercy and your loving kindness to us. That to redeem slaves, you would give a son. Lord, how holy is this morning when wickedness is put to flight and sin is washed away. Lord, it restores us who are fallen. It restores joy to those who mourn. Casts out pride and hatred and brings peace, concord, and life. Lord, you are so good, and we are so thankful. Now may Christ, the morning star, who knows no setting, find his light burning in us always. May he light that fire anew in us again today as we celebrate his resurrection. In the name of Christ, our risen Lord, amen. Welcome to our sunrise service. Uh, So glad to see you who have come. It is an early start, I know, but it would have been about this time that the ladies would have been making their way to the tomb. It sort of puts all that back into perspective for us, even at this early hour. I know I kind of made the joke earlier, Christ may be risen, but the rest of us need five more minutes. But uh, Christ uh, did not waste any time on that Easter morning. So we are glad you are here this morning. Ron, I'm going to turn it over to you for a song. Turn to uh, song number 310, that's 310 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Stand if you would.
But you can be seated. I don't have a long, long sunrise sermon, but I do have a few things that I want to share with you today. This is, uh, I know for a lot of us, it probably is for me, a toss-up between Christmas and Easter as to what my favorite day is on the church calendar, because there are so many amazing things about them both, but I think the answer is whichever one I'm on at the time, because I, I appreciate everything about Lent and all of that season it takes to, to bring us here. I think it reminds us a lot of, of Christ's sacrifice, it reminds us of, pre- of preparation and all of those things, but then when we walk through Holy Week, when we get to that night on Thursday when he knew that it was coming, and then we get to Friday when it happened, and as we sort of immersively demonstrated in here that everything was plunged into darkness and everyone was just jarred into silence, then we arrive at the early morning like this and find that the light is still burning. This morning is like no other one. I think we can say it's the same in some ways as it was then. It's dark, it's early, it's a little chilly. It's Sunday. Um, now we're at church. Now they would, they would have actually gone to synagogue the day before. But we are here this morning. Those things are the same. But still, this morning is different than all the other ones. The story we've been tracing for the last few weeks takes its dramatic turn. And the amazing thing is, and I know when I say story, I'm just talking about what we tell. Because this is no made-up tale. This is no mere story. This is the life of Christ that affects and changes and gives life to all of us. And so let's, if you have your Bible with you, you're welcome to open to Matthew chapter 28. And uh, since we're here gathered in those same early hours, we'll hear again that glorious news. Matthew 28, and I'm going to begin at verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, or he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. And so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, how marvelous is this every time we read it because lord death could not even hold you and it is a a wonder and a miracle to me that that you who aren't held by any of those things still join us in this place and join us in worship and and not just let us speak to you but you're glad to hear from us lord we celebrate all of that this morning we celebrate life in the midst of of death. We celebrate joy where there should have been sorrow. And Lord, all those things that you turned around between the cross and the tomb. Bless us this morning, Lord. Bless this message. And we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. So the women are going to the tomb. The other accounts spell that out a little little more lengthily. At least a couple of them do. They're going there to, to take care of Jesus' body. They came to see the tomb, but also to, to care for him, as you would for a close relative or, or friend. Usually in the days following burial, you would come with spices and ointments and, and those things. Now, they had, have had to wait 
a couple of days. They couldn't do it on Friday because it was going into the Sabbath. Sun was going down and you weren't allowed to do that. And then it was also Passover. So for those first couple of days, it could not have, could not have gone in there. So now they've come back Sunday morning with this solemn duty. They're expected to go and attend to the corpse of their beloved teacher and friend. What they got instead was the shock of a lifetime. Can you, could you imagine if you rolled up to a cemetery to visit the grave of a friend or a relative and instead you found the grave open and an angel sitting on the headstone? I mean, we've never run into that. It's not something that happens every day, is it? <laughs> I've never been to a funeral that, that changed in the middle of the funeral, you know? But it happened here because death couldn't hold him down. Because Jesus was exactly who he said he was and came back exactly as he had promised. It, was just, it wasn't just these women who needed this news. It was the disciples and it wasn't just them. It was the whole world who had lost its Lord on the cross and it looked like it was all over. But no, no, it was not. Because Jesus has a way of taking things that look like they aren't good for much or good for anything, like a tomb might be, and changing the entire direction of how those things go and turning them back entirely a different way. I mean, this is the Lord who changes water to wine early on in his ministry because they were running out at wedding. It would have brought great shame to the family if that had happened. And so Jesus steps in. Jesus changes it, not just to prove that he could change one thing into another thing, but to prove that he was Lord over time. Because wine takes time. It takes a while, unless you're Jesus. His time is not the same for him. He lords over it. He has it in his hand. He shows up at Zacchaeus' home, a tax collector. Tax collectors were not good for much. Some of you might make jokes about the IRS right there. You're Tax collectors were not good for much. And in this day, they were really not good for much except for stealing more money than they were required to collect. I mean, it was like an epidemic with them. It really was. They were well known. A tax collector probably cheated you. It was just how that went. And Zacchaeus was really no different. Not good for much until Jesus showed up. Suddenly, Zacchaeus is giving back, and he's not just giving back what he's taken. He's giving back four times as much as he had stolen to the people he took it from. Turned him from someone who was a thief into someone who became generous. He wasn't good for much until Jesus showed up. Jesus broke up the funeral of Lazarus. I heard, <laughs> heard Mark, you know who Mark Lowry is? Gaither vocal band and Christian community. I heard him talking about this story once. And he said, Jesus walked up and broke up the funeral of Lazarus. He said, he said we're Baptists. You don't break up a good funeral. <laughs> he said, let him lay there. <laughs> he, I, he did say that in some churches, if you were going to raise the dead, you'd have to raise them all. And uh, I don't feel like we have that problem. But Jesus, had, I mean, Jesus couldn't pass a funeral without breaking it up. Walked in and had him open the tomb. There's a four-day-old dead body in there. You want to talk about not good for much? I mean, I've never known anybody who was dead for four days who was doing anything. I mean, surely Jesus couldn't do anything with that. But no, suddenly it's loose him and let him go free. And Lazarus come forth. And suddenly Lazarus is living again. Death had become life in his hands. A little boy's lunch to feed 5,000 people. People possessed by demons going free again. A Samaritan woman showing up in the middle of the day at an old well just to draw some water. First of all, the women usually came in the morning. She came in the middle of the day to avoid everybody else. Jesus went there right then on purpose and gave her way more water than she could have bargained for. And Jesus has taken these things that might not have seemed good for much and reversed them totally, but a cross tomb? Hey, that seems like the tallest of tall orders to me. I mean, surely the women were thinking that the events of the last couple of days were it. I mean, they had never seen somebody crucified who they could talk to again later. It just didn't work that way. I mean, this was not a good morning for them at first. Their job was not a good one. It was not a pleasant one. It was not something they wanted to ever have to do. The whole situation was terrible. 
There are guards and soldiers and a whole lot of controversy and nobody's safe. I mean, we really don't hear anything about the disciples between Friday and Sunday. And we're pretty sure that's because they were all hiding, except for Judas, and he's not living anymore. This has not been a good couple of days. And so they're sneaking down there because of all this controversy. They're sneaking down here in the early morning, in the middle of all of this not good stuff. And then all of a sudden it's, why do you seek the living among the dead? And when's the last time you went to a cemetery to look for a living person? They didn't go there expecting to find what they found. But Jesus had taken this place of death. He had taken this thing that surely looked like it was the worst of the worst. It wasn't just that it was not good for much. It wasn't good for anything. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, for he has risen just as he said. The cross and the grave which looked like they were good for nothing except for agony and grief and despair were changed completely on that Sunday morning and the grave became a place of hope. That light of life is burning. The heart is beating and Jesus is living again. And folks, it's the same thing that our resurrected Lord does with us. We might not feel like we're good for much sometimes. Jesus has a way of coming into when we are the most broken, when we are hurting the most, when we feel like we are at the most lost and messed up and changing all of that stuff, doesn't he? I mean, he doesn't just change things for the better. He changes people. I heard somebody say one time that Jesus did not come to turn bad people into good people. Jesus came so that dead people could live absolutely what he does. And you know what? It did not end at the cross. We do not worship a dead Jesus. The cross holds a lot of, and I'll expand this later because it's the theme of my, my sermon later on, but the cross and the grave hold a lot of empty promises for us. It's empty because Jesus paid the cost once and for all, and it's empty because you and I don't have to go there. The tomb was one massive empty promise because Jesus didn't stay there. Just borrowed it for a couple of days. The promise is that we don't have to stay there forever, that death has become life in the hands of Jesus. All it took him to defeat all of sin and death and hell in the grave was just a couple of nights. He didn't just do that for himself. He did it for each and every one of us. He redeems absolutely everything he can get his hands on. I love that. I mean, it's like he, he could take the most messed up, broken, sinful, in pieces kind of heart and put it all back together. He can find us in all of our worst, deepest, hardest places and bring life, even in the midst of the greatest darkness. From the darkest of nights came the sunrise, and from the grave came a resurrected living Savior who is still alive now and forever. Amen? Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Sounds 
forget, uh, 9.30, we'll be back here again for a regular service. Uh, Mount Tabor at 11, or 11, 11.15 probably for Mount Tabor. We'll move that for 15 minutes for the sake of having communion in both services. It helps us to not be quite so pressed when we begin the second one. Uh, no evening service tonight also. I'll go ahead and make sure everyone knows that. So we'll see you in a couple of hours. Let's close with a benediction. And now may the risen and resurrected Lord dwell richly with you. May he fill your soul and your spirit with life and with hope and with peace. And may he empower you to live as resurrection Easter people this day and forevermore. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.